Indeed. Now we know. <laughs> okay. Got it. <laughs> Welcome everyone. I'm Liz Beezy. I'm the chair of the Motive Board. It's great to be here with everybody. I'm excited to have our guest, Rachel Jacobson. Um, she's done a lot of work to improve Omaha from founding and leading film streams to her current work leading heritage services. So really great to have her here. She's also on a sort of side note, married to a mode shift longtime supporter and former board member, Steven Osberg, who's really great. So we're excited to have her. Um, I think we'll maybe do a couple announcements and then let her sort of kick it off. Um, what did I want to say? Thanks everybody who's been parking bikes at the College World Series this week. Um, and yeah, Sarah, if people want to stay in the loop on bike volunteer opportunities, are there good ways to do that? Oh, you've already got it in the chat. Thanks. Yes, I do. It's on my list too. So yeah, if you want to volunteer to sign up um, to help park bikes, we're actually doing a really great job this year. Thank you so much to everyone who has stepped up to volunteer because we only have one spot left right now. So high five to everyone who has signed up. Um, it is Saturday the 26th. Yes, this coming Saturday at 1230 is the last spot we have available. So that's exciting because last year, or I guess it wasn't a thing last year, but previously um, we haven't had as, as much amazing volunteer sign up. So everyone's doing great this time. Do you want me to keep going with other updates or you? Yeah, yeah. if you have city council and other updates you want to share. Yeah, yep. Um, so Kind of just a quick recap from the last city council meeting when uh, a lot of MoShift members were awesome once again, I'm just real jazzed on volunteers right now, um, stepped up and testified at city council um, via Zoom or in person or wrote to your counselor suggesting that they uh, lay over the park rules um, or at least vote no on them as they were written because they were attempting to uh, have park trails, which isn't a new thing. Like the, this has been the, the park rules and the hours of the parks have been the same for a long time. But the conversation that started last October when they attempted to ban certain types of e-bikes on the trail prompted a bigger conversation about how trails are crucial as transportation for a lot of folks and should be treated as such 24 seven. So we, um, yeah, rallied the troops and got a pretty good showing at, at city hall and gratefully, um, the council decided to lay it over. And I've been in discussions with Matt Kalsevich, who's the new parks director, who seems to be a, a good guy willing to talk with us. So we're gonna set up a meeting, I think next week. Um, so if anybody does have feedback that they would like me to share, he asked Julie Harris and I to be kind of the conduits to our organizations to gather and distribute feedback. So I think it seems like it's going in the right direction. He was, he was open to um, the concept of ensuring that they would remain open 24 seven. So. That was good. Um, yeah, the other I, thing I go ahead, Sarah, for all of your work on that. Motif submitted comments thanks to mostly Sarah's work, um, and yeah, I think that's a you know pretty big victory for City Council to not just sort of approve something that was proposed because that's what usually happens. So um, we should be we should celebrate just the you know postponing it uh, at some level. But one thing I was going to say is that this is not public yet, but we are in talks and we might get a grant, like sort of a grant to access data from SPIN. Sarah and my spouse, Ryan um, Wishart have been working together on a proposal there and that would help us access data, which might help the city, help the city around this issue um, with the parks and like, do people use the trails for transportation at night um, could sort of help answer that question. So that's a sort of, my exciting side note. Totally. Um, one last thing, um, aside from just, I guess, really quickly, Tuesday, the 29th at 6 p.m. is our next transit team meeting. If you want to join that, um, the link, if you ever go to just modeshiftomaha.org on the right side, there's like a calendar um, and it's got links to different meetings if you want to register. So the transit team is going to meet on the 29th um, at 6 p.m. And then July 6th, which is also a Tuesday at 5.30 p.m., the missing middle team is going to meet. Um, and then I did want to just bring up... Um, Council Club is a thing that we've been doing on Thursday nights, which is just like nerds that gather and look at the agenda. Um, that's how we kind of first saw the, the park rules thing. And we've kind of um, been keeping an eye on that. So that's also something that's definitely open to the public. It's another just Zoom meeting, 7.30 on Thursdays. Um, and I've got links 
on my own page, maybe I'll drop them there, but it's just kind of a good way to stay on top of what's happening at city council so that we can get in front of things like the park rules before it's too late, because some stuff just gets hidden in the consent agenda and it just gets pushed through with a lot of other stuff. But um, yeah, I think that's all I had. Liz, you got anything else or should we just let Rachel take it away? Um, I think I was just gonna do a quick, intro um and then we can ha have time at the end too and people can use the chat and we encourage questions and stuff in the chat the whole time and we can have more announcements and stuff at the end if people have them but um i was just going to do a quick sort of context that you know i said a little bit about rachel and how great it was to have her and um you know heritage services i think maybe many of us are familiar but they hold, you know, a ton of power in Omaha. They've leveraged hundreds of millions of dollars in private and mostly private, I think, but some public funds as well for a bunch of big development projects. Um, one of their current projects is this Cue at Luminarium we're gonna hear more about. Um, and I think, you know, Mode Shift is obviously interested in, you know, are there ways we could work together to improve multimodal transportation and, you know, align with some of the city goals around, you know, keeping young people in Omaha and making it a better place to be for everyone. So excited to talk more about that. But thanks, Rachel, for being here. I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone, for being here. It's good to see you all. Um, yeah, like Liz said, you know, Steve's been involved with Moshe for a really long time, former board member, and, you know, he is with the Greater Omaha Chambers, you probably all know, and so, you know, actually when we, when we first started dating, he was reading Death and Life of Great American Cities in <laughs> Blue Line, and I came up to him, and I was like, I was going to recommend that for my book club, and he's like, you have a book club? And you're interested in urban planning and so like right from the beginning you know like it's it's been all about that and you know i moved back to omaha in 2005 uh after you know five years of living and working in new york city and i don't think i ever really thought about the built environment until i lived in a city that was walkable and where i didn't have to have a car <laughs> um you know i uh I actually hated driving and I let my license expire when I lived in New York. So when I got back, that was like the thing I was like most nervous about, not starting a new YAF train. Yeah. Um, I was a JMZ like for a long time. Uh, but I um I was I wasn't as nervous about starting a nonprofit as I was about driving again, to be totally honest. And so um, so yeah, so what an amazing opportunity, you know. Know, um, film streams, uh, you know, when I moved home to start it, it was all about um, film. It was all about promoting film as an art form and, um, you know, bringing the kinds of movies that I was really excited about to Omaha. Um, but Omaha, everyone's such collaborators and it's such a dynamic environment. And it ended up, you know, really truly being like this community organization and this forum and this place where we could partner with lots of different organizations. Um, we definitely have had at least one partnership with MoShift. Um, and, you know, I mean, it was just such a fun experience. Um, I didn't realize how, how much it was gonna be in and of the city. And then in order to do it, I, you know, I had to figure out how to run a nonprofit and I had to, you know, figure out board development and fundraising. And fortunately, I had a little bit of fundraising background, but, um, you know, and all the, this stuff. And so, and I realized that my job as executive director, it wasn't just choosing movies like I had fantasized. It was really like this institute, big institutional stuff, you know? And um, so, so the skills that I developed, and then we did two building projects. We did two capital campaigns and building projects. So we built, um, you know, the Recycle Off Theater in uh, North Downtown Omaha. And that was what I moved home for because my friends at Saddle Creek were building Slowdown. I moved home in 2007 to do, I mean, we opened Recycle Off in 2007. And, um, and then, you know, we, um, 10 years later, after operating the Recycle Off Theater, we acquired the Dundee Theater, um, and we were able to renovate and restore and reopen that. And so, you know, 
when you think about what heritage does, you know, they, you know, a lot of people don't know that much about heritage. There's a little bit of mystery around it, you know, part of, you know, what I'm trying to do, you know, and just how I am, I'm like a pretty open and transparent person. So part of what I'm trying to do is like tell her story a little better because it's actually, um, you know, a, a pretty, uh, pretty uh, impactful organization and they've done, you know, a lot of good things, um, you know, so um, when I had the opportunity, you know, um, Walter, Walter Scott was founded uh, Heritage 30 years ago and, um, and Sue Morris, who was my predecessor, she ran it for 25 years. And, um, and so I, so Mike McCarthy, who's now the new board chair, he's the one that um, suggested that, uh, that this might be a job for me. And, um, and I didn't, like, at first, I didn't really see it as a, such a fit, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I'm not so sure. But as I thought about it more and more, it's like, you know, what an amazing opportunity to have, you know, a tremendous impact. And, even if, you know, uh, you know, the modes of doing things are sort of, you know, from a private perspective and private philanthropy and all of that kind of stuff, like it's an opportunity to do broader engagement around these projects. It's an opportunity to really think about what you all are advocating for about the built environment that surrounds them and, um, and really build up organizations that are, that are very mission oriented and in of the community. Um, so, um, so it was really amazing that my first project would be, um, this, uh, Kiewit Luminarium, which is, you know, what I'll talk about mostly here today. Um, it's the new science center. I'm sure you've heard on the riverfront and, um, you know, on Lewis and Clark landing and, oh my gosh, I cannot imagine a better project to walk into. Honestly, like when I came in. Um, it's called Kiwit Luminarium because we have five lead donors who are Kiwit affiliated. Um, Kiwit Companies, the Peter Kiwit Foundation, Walter Scott, um, um, uh, the Grook, and the Grukok, the Grukok family, sorry, four lead donors. <laughs> um, and so um, Sue had raised the bulk of the funding from those four lead donors, or a good percentage, 75% of it from those lead donors when I came in. And um, she had also engaged Exploratorium to design all the exhibits. Exploratorium, if you guys, has anyone been there? It's absolutely incredible, you guys. If you go to San Francisco, you gotta check it out. It is a science center that was um, established in 1969 and um, by Frank Oppenheimer. And it's all about experiential learning. It's on the, um, it's like on the pier in San Francisco. Um, Sarah, you've been, right? Have you ever been? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, yeah, it's, uh, so it's, I mean, it's just like such a dynamic and wonderful and thoughtful place. And honestly, I think like Silicon Valley, like, you know, you can't, it's hard to make that direct connection, but there are like Silicon Valley CEOs who were, part of like explainers, which I'll talk about a little bit later um, for the museum. So that's really, really cool. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here and I'll tell you a little bit more about what we've been able to do, but it's been, oh, uh oh, host to state disabled participant screen sharing. Can I? Could I request it or something or? Try that now. I made you a co-host. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Everyone can see that? Yeah. Okay. This is a big PDF, so hopefully it doesn't get silly like big PDFs sometimes do. But so you can see, um, you know, it's a really cool building. HDR designed it, and it's right on the riverfront and Lewis and Clark Landing, right where Rick's Boatyard um, used to be. Um, this is facing, so the river's behind here. Um, this is an image, actually, we haven't quite fundraised for this part, these lights on the building, but I think it could be really cool if we had like artists and science, uh, you know, scientists collaborations to do uh, stuff on the side of the building that could be really exciting. Um, this is the view from Council Bluffs, which is pretty cool. Um, this is the construction site. I think this was a few weeks ago. Actually, steel is going up. 
just this week. So that's really wonderful. We broke ground in November. Um, so this is where it is. So, um, so if you know Lewis and Clark Landing, um, you know, there's kind of this concrete that has a little bit of a pattern on it. There's going to be some, um, so, so the projects all around us, these are the project limits for Kiewit Luminarium. All around us is what Mecca is going to manage, which is part of the riverfront um, project. And Heritage is sort of involved with the riverfront project, but not, we're not fully, like, I'm not, I'm not making the calls on the riverfront project, but I'm, I, I'm definitely engaged with it. Um, and then Mecca, you know, is going to run the parks all around it. And this parking lot is actually owned by the city and Mecca is going to manage that as well. So this park right here is going to be awesome. It's like kind of modeled on Mary Daly, Mary Daly Park in Chicago. And it's going to be like a super accessible, um, really vibrant, beautiful uh, park. So that's really awesome to compliment. And, you know, I'll talk through like the design here, but there's a, there's going to be a restaurant. We're going to be looking for a restaurant partner. So if you know people who have ideas, reach out to me because we really want, um, kind of like we did at Lola's at Dundee, we really want like a vibrant partner that attracts their own um, audience and kind of makes this whole place, you know, feel more active and fun. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know how much you guys have seen the connectivity on the trails and stuff, but you should probably have someone uh, <laughs> come maybe from Mecca, maybe Katie from Mecca would come to a meeting because she could kind of talk through, um, you know, the trail connectivity, because it's something that I've been really interested in and I've been asking about a lot. Um, is how the trails connect from the north and the south. I think one thing that is really um, is really cool about this project is that you know you have this whole experience where in Council Bluffs, you know, there's so much activity going on over there too. You've got these great parks over there and the art center and everything and the new development. And then you can come over the bridge and you can walk over here, the Bob Carey Bridge, you can walk down here and you can have this whole experience at Luminarium, you can have lunch, you can play in the park. And it's almost like, I don't know if you guys have been to New York City where, you know, they have the High Line and it connects um, to the Whitney, you know, so you kind of have this whole experience where you can do all these things and then there's restaurants there and everything. So it's like, it just feels like, I mean, you have to go and park there or, or you can bike there if you're willing to do that, you know, or if you do that, which I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, but, um, but, you know, you can really have like kind of a walkable experience with a lot of different things to do. So I think that that's great. Um, so this is kind of the layout. There's this restaurant here and you can see they'll have their own entrance. And then there's this little overhang here that has some outdoor seating. When you first walk in, there's going to be this little guest shop. Um, this is like a room for field trips. Um, like a good 17, 18% of our visitors are going to be, you know, students and teachers coming for field trips all week long. Um, that is a really big deal. So, um, and um, we've got a few different galleries that I'll kind of walk through. This is actually a temporary gallery space. Um, and we are in the process of hiring a CEO right now. And so, um, so we've kind of left that for them to program. Um, but the rest of this is all being developed by Exploratorium. So it's going to have all these exhibits that are kind of semi-permanent that'll be really cool. Um, and they have Exploratorium. It's really important to them to like have kind of the shop in-house and that they do you know fix and develop all of their exhibits in-house and you can get really see it and so there's going to be a window to the shop back here and we're actually work, working with metro and talking about partnering on you know kind of workforce development classes and things like that that can be about repairing and building the exhibits so that'll add to the vibrancy this is like a maker space and a wood shop so there's some really cool stuff. There's two more galleries up here, which I'll talk about. And, um, and let's see. And then this is the administrative space. And then there's a couple of like flexible, more flexible classrooms. Um, 
this organization is going to be all about partnerships, all about like not reinventing, you know, what people are doing, you know, um, locally, because there's a lot of activity around STEM education, um, but really inviting tons of partners in to present and promote their work and everything else. So this is just an image of, you know, what it's going to look like when you're looking up um, on this, this is the south side of the building. So from the park, you're going to be able to see this. I'll talk about this geometry climber that you're going to be able to see in the window. So that's going to be really exciting for people. And there's the main entrance here. There's the cafe and the river you can see behind. So this is, so the river's um, to the right of the screen here. And this is kind of an image of the outdoor seating at the cafe. This is one of the classrooms. Um, this is the maker space. It's all about like giving people, you know, um, that that autonomy, that ownership, that um, you know, um, uh, uh, that capability, knowing that they have the capability to create things and thinking about how things are created. Um, because really, like the biggest goal of this is, um, you know, is to attract a broad, diverse audience to STEM fields at an early age, but the coolest thing about it is that Exploratorium and this is really for all ages. Um, I'll talk more about audiences. So this is like an image when you first walk in, you can see the pegboard stuff. It's gonna be kind of fun to play with. There's a gift shop over here, classroom over here. Uh, by the way, I just wanna say, I can't really see the chat right now. So if anyone's asking me questions, you could just like interrupt me or something if you, <laughs> if you need to. Um, so this is uh, an image of the restaurant, but obviously once you bring in a restaurant partner, they'll kind of put their own stamp on it. Um, yeah, this is the timeline. We're hoping to open April of 2023, which would be great. And we're going to have this period where um, construction is going to be substantially completed by September of 2022, which is so soon, you guys. It's like next year. Um, <laughs> so, um, so then there's going to be like six months of exhibit installation, and then we'll open in April of 2023. Um, this is the founding board of directors. Um, Bruce Gupak, who's the former chair of Kiwa, is um, sort of the founder of the organization. He's really been motivated to do it. Um, but we're lucky to have educators like Cheryl Logan and Lance Perez on our leadership. And, um, and you've got Lance Fritz, who's the you know, chair of UP, and um, Jade Miller from Gallup. So you can kind of see like this, you know, this, um, like as we connect, you know, students from, you know, from elementary and high school to college to, you know, internships at different corporations and that whole thing. So that whole thing has been really intentional um, to, with the leadership from the beginning. This is kind of a beautiful rendering that they did, but yeah, it's really about developing Omaha into this, you know, wellspring of creativity and innovation, nurturing emerging engineers and scientists, drawing families, young and old, and tourists and learners of all ages to these thriving institutions of the city. And, um, you know, it's in a place to explore astonishing phenomena and learn with your hands. And it's all about joyful learning. And you'll see that um, so we're trying to really inspire that lifelong interest in careers and STEM. So, you know, it's, a, a, like I said, you know, welcoming diverse audiences, inspiring professional possibilities, um, cultivating excellence and partnership in STEM, fostering that pride of place, and then also about, you know, creating that great riverfront attraction in that place um, aspect. So, like I was saying, the audience is... Um, it's really kind of everyone, um, but, you know, those K through 12 schools are important. Um, I brought my two-year-old to Exploratorium and she had a great time, but really learning is, it, it's, it's more about six plus, you know, um, so, and, and that goes on up, like they, I'll talk a little bit about, they have an adult day on Thursday nights that's hugely successful, like it's hugely popular and, because it's just such a fun place to be for everybody. And I'm learning so much just learning through the exhibit development because I'm not a STEM person and it's like English and political science. So um, it's really, really fun. Um, and definitely educators are gonna be a really important part of our partners. You know, we'll definitely have, you know, locally and nationally known scientists coming to do presentations, but also partnering with the maker and artists and designer communities. Um, the 
Exploratorium has been great about being really thoughtful about developing, you know, um, a, a framework for equity and access right from the beginning um, and our approach to, you know, kind of trust building and partnership, uh, thinking about representation and perspectives and also just humility, you know, just like um, really being really intentional about reaching out to a lot of different community members from the beginning and they are even from San Francisco on Zoom in a pandemic, they're doing a really good job of um, trying to reach out to a lot of different um, community members. And one way that we have, um, have sort of done that for the institution to begin is we put together this great group of advice, this great advisory group that um, represents um, people that are, you know, working in STEM or adjacent to STEM in some way, but who can also like, Kind of inform the exhibits as we're developing them. So it's a um, really wonderful group of people. Like I'm sure you, a lot of you know Taylor Keene, who does Sacred Seed. Um, he's a member of the Omaha Tribe, or Julie Sigmund, who does the STEM ecosystem, Sydney Franklin from 75 North. Um, Derek Nero is really cool. He teaches science, te he teaches educators how to teach science and how to teach engineering at UNO. Um, so and it, it's a, it's a really great group. Um, so this is kind of the schematic design. Um, we've got uh, the four galleries I mentioned. So when you first walk in, this is called Building Knowledge. And then we have Building the World right here, Building Self and Community upstairs, and then Making It Count. And you know these are kind of the experience principles that we have established. It's really about welcoming everyone. It's about sparking curiosity embracing authenticity, creating clarity and inspiring surprise and delight. The, and you'll see Exploratorium is really serious about um, how they develop exhibits in that way. So the, the Building the World Gallery is the first one when you walk in and it's sort of the, the basic building blocks of physics. Um, so it's sound and light and heat and temperature and motion. Um, this is an image of the gallery. I love these. You can see that the building's really just like a container for the super dynamic exhibits that Exploratorium is developing. Um, this is, um, th these are some of the exhibits. So um, I'm going to go through a few of them, but you can see like their design, the design is so thoughtful and cool. And a lot of these actually do exist in Exploratorium, but they've um, sort of evolved them specifically for us. So that's really fun too. Um, yeah, this is, this is really fun. This is a heat camera. Um, so you can, you can kind of like play around and guess, you know, what parts of, you know, what parts are um, uh, hotter and cooler of your body or objects that you hold up and things like that. Uh, this one's really fun and I love um, the way that they've evolved it from what they have at Exploratorium. This is the one that they have at Exploratorium. So it measures the decibels as you're walking on this gravel. So you can see how quietly you can walk. And the way they set it up is that, um, that you can, you, everyone can like watch people and see how, how they do so that they can have competitions, um, which is way cooler than what they have at Exploratorium. Um, this is a giant slinky, so it goes all the way across um, uh, the space. It's pretty cool. Um, and you can learn about waves and teach about waves through that. Um, this echo tube is longer than the echo tube that they have at Exploratorium, which is cool. It'll wind all the way through here and you can stand at one side and the other and you can like kind of measure sound waves through um, through that and you can measure the speed of sound. Um, and so, it's a pretty fun way to teach, you know, those physics principles. Um, the Building the World Gallery is, you know, something that I could see, you know, applying to Mode Shift if you guys did like education programs and things like that, because there is like a whole, um, it's kind of all about how the built environment interacts with the natural environment and getting people to be thoughtful about, um, about you know, how we've built our world, how we've chosen to build, um, build on our, um, on the earth and, um, you know, what's possible. So um, this one is the chain reaction. So it's kind of like a Rube Goldberg thing and uh, it's pretty fun. Um, this is a circuit workbench. So you have to 
you know, um, you have six activity stations and you have a different set of challenges of each. And so, you know, some of them are super simple, like you connect a light and a battery to make a flashlight or you get, it gets more complex. Like you have to use both batteries to make a motor and a light um, come on with one switch. Um, and so this is the um, Cantonary Arch exhibit. This is the materials lab. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, oh, I think we're missing a slide on the grid. The grid is the part that, that's that big tower that you saw in the renderings. And that part um, is really gonna be a cool experience and thinking about, uh, thinking like there's gonna be a whole section on sidewalks, you guys. So <laughs> that's gonna be pretty, pretty on mission, pretty on point. Um, and there's gonna be um, sort of like different, um, uh, yeah, like all of the exhibits in there are gonna be um, really great for the kind of work that you're doing. And, and there's also gonna be definitely some sort of city model there. So you can kind of see how, um, how the built environments, and it's gonna be a model of Omaha and you can kind of see how the buildings sit on um, on the land currently and how they could. Um, so um, this, this one is building self and community. This is more like starting with um, like uh, the biological sciences and going to the social sciences. Um, and there's kind of these self exhibits as well. Um, so a lot of the biological exhibits are about cells. Um, they're kind of focused on cells. So if you like kind of start by thinking of yourself as made up of cells, there's something kind of zen about that, I think. And then, and then all of the exhibits that are about the self kind of have this whole experience of, um, you know, how, how these different lights make you feel. This is kind of the mood ring exhibit. <laughs> um, and then, you know, uh, in the in the social cell section, I can see a lot of organizations doing their like DEI work here um, because there's a lot about um, privilege and bias. And um, this exhibit particularly is um, what load do you carry? So, you know, you kind of go through all of these sort of uh, I guess binary things about like I'm over 40 years old, I'm under 40 year years old, I'm Christian, I'm not a Christian. I don't have a disabling health condition. I have a disabling health condition. I don't speak English fluently or speak it with an accent. I speak English fluently without an accent. And you kind of um, figure out, you know, what load you're carrying, you know, um, uh, in from the start. So um, that's pretty interesting in terms of like thinking about privilege. Um, uh, this is really fun. So we have a math gallery and there's not that many math galleries at science centers throughout the country. Like they just don't do them very well. It's just not that interesting to people, but <laughs> so Exploratorium is super excited to develop some math exhibits that, um, that are really engaging. Like this is kind of fun. It's like exponential dominoes. So you can, you know, think about um, accrued interest on an investment or a loan. Um, you know, um, and you know, the, how, cause you start with this tiny domino and then it can knock down the big one. Um, I love this one, you guys, cause, um, no one talks about money very well. And I just feel like, I feel like priests and rabbis should, uh, like bring married couples or people who are about to get married here to do this because you, you have this set of cards that have, you know, statements about money on them. So your self-worth equals your net worth. Money should be saved, not spent. Money corrupts people. It's hard to be poor and happy. And you have to sit with a partner and decide whether you agree, uh, strongly disagree, disagree, agree to disagree, agree, or strongly agree. So that one's going to be intense, but it'll be <laughs> uh, this is really cool. So there'll be like 3 million digits of pi on this wall. And, um, and within that, within those 3 million digits, you can find any number. Sorry, my children are in the back right next to us. <laughs> it's going to be here shouting. Um, so I, um, that's where Steve is right now. <laughs> Uh, so ba basically you can find any number, you can find your zip code, you can find your phone number, um, uh, whatever you need and we'll have the coordinates there. So that's really cool. 
this is a rendering of what the geometry climber is going to look like. So, um, and there's this little bridge um, and this shape called the Stella right here. Um, uh, here's another uh, vision of the geometry climber. It's really, really cool because, um, you know, I guess there's all this research that, you know, being in these shapes really helps people understand complex shapes in a different way. And so once they get in the classroom, they're going to have a better understanding of, you know, um, this geometry. Like if they're climbing in it when they're eight, when they're learning it, when they're 13, it's going to be, it's going to come easier to them. And that's kind of what it's all about. It's all, uh, it's about sparking that interest early, but also about those different ways into learning because traditional pedagogy doesn't really work for everybody. Right. So, um, so I think that that's really exciting for people too. Um, so um, yeah, this has a few different elements, the Stella and the gyroid and the um, net over the gyroid. And then there's this nice, uh, that lava thing is um, right in that window, you know, that's just to the south. So that's pretty, pretty special here. So still being developed. So you might not see all of that, you know, when we open or you might see, you know, things refined and stuff like that, but this is a fun preview. Um, and, you know, there's going to be programming here, too, as well as exhibits. Um, there's too much here to uh, read, but this is kind of, um, you know, the goals that we've established from the beginning. Um, you know, it, it's about really, I love this line about, you know, intrinsic motivation for learning, because ultimately that's what it's all about. It's just joyful learning and joyful engagement with learning, but also that feeling of self-efficacy and the sense that you're capable of um, successfully completing tasks or achieving goals. Um, so, um, you know, talked about the um, organizational culture. This is kind of complicated, but, um, but it also really shows, um, I think one thing that will be interesting is to this group is like, I, I really think that this will be most successful if we, if these kids, these high school and middle school kids are part of this drop-in experience group. If the high school and middle kid, middle school kids just are drawn to wanting to come down here on their own, and it's not just about coming, you know, on the school bus, then we'll have been successful. And we have to make sure that there's modes of getting there. Um, so it's really important that, you know, obviously, you know, Metro is planning a bus stop there. It's really important, you know, and I plan to, uh, you know, advocate for this that it has, you know, frequent stops and that it's easy to get to um, for people who um, don't have cars or need access in different ways. Um, but yeah, like the different events that we're going to do, I talked a little bit about the explainers program. That is a really cool thing and it's going to be a huge part of what we do. Somewhere between 50 and 100 kids a year, we're going to have paid programs um, for, for high school kids where they are basically docents and you know they learn all the exhibits and they work um, with patrons while they're in there. Um, so that's going to be really special. I mentioned adult night, which is hugely popular. And I think it'll be really popular here too. Um, field trips are huge as I talked about, and then community events, lots of partner events, lots of, you know, um, all the great things um, that are already happening in Omaha, like bringing people who are doing amazing work here in town uh, to present on it um, and engage with our audiences. So, um, you know, this is a little bit more about the explainers program. And like I said, they're paid and, um, and, you know, they'll, they'll basically learn so much with it. Um, it's going to be such a great learning experience, but they're also like really important staff. And, um, I'm just so excited, uh, for their experiences. Um, so yeah, this is probably, probably more detail than you need on it, but yeah, I've already told you guys about some of that. So yeah, so that's what I have. Um, let's see here, I can see questions now. <laughs> All right. 
Is it a replacement for a competitor to the Children's Museum? So really, really it's intended to be all ages. Like, um, so that makes it a little bit different um, than the Children's Museum. You kind of age out of the Children's Museum when you're around eight. And this is really about learning six plus, you know, all the way up to, you know, all of us um, and, and beyond. So, um, so I think it's, it's just more intentional. It's more advanced. It's more accessible for everyone. Um, whereas the children's museum is up to, up to age eight. So it's definitely a different demographic, but we'll figure out how to complement each other and how to partner and everything else. Um, maker artists and designer communities are part of the mission. I'd really like to see the language describing, yeah, steam. Um, you know, I, um, the the founders have wanted to call to reference STEM. I mean, there's definitely going to be a huge art component, and like there is, there are exhibits there, like in that um, grid that I was talking about. There's a whole thing on like fashion, and it's all about like jeans and materials and repairing um, repairing things and thinking about care and processes of care. Um, so it's really, really cool. I mean, there's a lot of elements that directly relate to art, but um, right now we're not talking about it as a, a STEAM center, even though it makes a lot of sense, frankly. Um, so, um, but it's going to be there. So um, will these displays and interactions change or are they static over a few months a year? So, um, so I pointed out that temporary gallery, that's where things will change more frequently. Um, the exhibits, you know, there, some of them might, you know, shift over time. Um, I mean, we think that the two um, sort of marquee exhibits, the climber and the grid are probably going to be, you know, 20 year exhibits, everything else, you know, might be there like three to five years, um, you know, and, and move around and shift over time and we might develop you know, Exploratorium has like 2000 exhibits. So, and we're gonna have like a hundred when we open. So, um, so there's definitely potential there. There's potential to develop some here um, and there's potential for touring exhibits and everything else. Um, uh, and is there a plan to better advertise the riverfront and the museum to tourists west of 10th street? Brian, do you wanna add on any to your question there? Are you there? <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm all about getting places, but it seems like a lot of the riverfront development is focused on still getting car traffic to park in front of the museum. When really we gotta be focusing on getting people to park at their hotels and walking to the riverfront. But we can't point people there. A lot of people just don't even know it's there. There's two pedestrian bridges. I've had to tell a lot of people where those are. You know, so what's the signage? What are the direction markers to get people under 480? Yeah, no, I mean, that's something that we haven't, I mean, we've definitely talked about the fact that we need to have really good signage and that we need to have really good wayfinding signage that comes from downtown specifically, but we haven't developed it yet. Um, I mean, that might be something that you guys could, you know, kind of help with from a, you know, from a bike perspective. I think that'd be great. Um, you know, I, um, I think that, um, yeah, it's definitely in the works that we would have, um, signage and, you know, I mean, there are, um, there are, there is link, you know, linked bike and pedestrian trails that come from, you know, the baby Bob is happening as you know, and that's important. And, um, that's supposed to break ground early next year. Um, and then, you know, like that. So that's going to make a tremendous difference. Like having worked in North downtown for 15 years, you know, we never, like it's impossible to, you know, you have not impossible, obviously, but you have to walk all the way around or you have to bike all the way around. So that's going to be huge. Um, and I agree with you. Signage is a big deal. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Clyde, I saw you raising your hand earlier. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, my question has uh, more to the site. Uh, back in 1997, we were finally successful getting the Asarco plant shut down. 
uh, got, got the EPA to do that. But the EPA allowed them to bury their waste on site. And that was why uh, it's very restrictive what you could build on that site. And I was just curious what precautions uh, when you're building this new uh, complex structure so you aren't getting into all and disturbing all that contaminated soil and other materials. Yeah, it was actually a really complicated process and it was um, it was like a very uh, <clears throat> like, I, I mean, in addition to the team of engineers that worked on, they developed this, um, they developed this idea that was actually kind of an innovation called, uh, where, where they, they use these micro piles. So, well, first of all, we couldn't go above two stories, right? Um, because you can't have the foundation go too far down there. And, um, and then there's, there's a GCL layer that separates, you know, kind of the contaminated soil from, you know, um, from the good soil above it. And, um, and the, we did have to, so they use these little tiny micro piles um, to make sure that they weren't um, that they weren't breaking through that GCL layer to a big degree, and then they uh, the dirt that came up from the little <laughs> micro piles they um, uh, put in a truck and uh, just uh, they brought it to a site somewhere <laughs> that, out out of state. I guess is what the process was. So it, it was um, so. It was um, very detailed. Um, I was on the site and they were, they had really good processes for the construction workers and everything. And once they got past, you know, um, all of that experience, um, it, it, they got through it really quickly and um, it was really thoughtful. We actually had another group of engineers. We've had, a, we, we've had people engaged who have you know, who were concerned about it. And so we had another group of engineers review what they were doing to make sure that it wouldn't be um, a danger for lead contamination on the site. So it was really, really thoughtful, really extensive. Thank you. If nobody else has a question, I was wondering if you could tell us more about the sidewalk situation. You said there was going to be like an exhibit about sidewalks. That's obviously something we care a lot about. Can you expand <laughs> upon that at all? Well, let me see if I have any lines of this. I was kind of looking for it because I just saw this is so, so the building the world gallery is kind of still in the works. And they have this grid. Oh, I got it. Okay. Yeah, let me pull this up for you. Oh, this, this might not be recent enough, actually. Yeah, so, so the grid, I'm going to share this with you. So this is this big structure and, you know, so they've been thinking a lot about, this was supposed to be kind of a materials tower and that's kind of where it started. And they grew it and developed it into, they were just thinking about the history of science and how the history of science is told and how it's kind of told around all of these men, basically mostly men, you know, like when you tell the story of science, you talk about Newton and you talk about, you know, um, you know, you talk about even like now you, you know, it's Elon Musk and it's Jeff Bezos and, you know, like Bill Gates and, um, and it's these individuals, but actually like the people who contribute to, you know, to making our world are so multifaceted and, you know, there's all these cycles of care and caring and all these people who contribute to that. So they decided they wanted to tell more of those stories um, than like the typical, um, you know, this person had this idea and that's how it happened. So, um, so they're kind of, they kind of went from focusing on just the materials to focusing on 
the materials and the community. And the core concept is all about care, um, about community connections and, um, and care. And so like, like, how is it made? You know, can we build something good? Can we fix it? And who cares? Like, I mean, my sister's an industrial designer. It's like, I think you could like teach an industrial design class for, you know, for kids here. So there's going to be two different floors. And the first is going to be about on the land. So that's going to be like the farmstead. Um, and then this part is going to be about the community. So that's where the sidewalks come in, Sarah. So concrete, pathways, streets, intersection, transportation alternatives. So this whole gallery is going to kind of be focused on your stuff. <laughs> so that's going to be really cool. Um, and then upstairs, you kind of have at home, you have the paint and the um, color and the door and the, um, you know, the structures. And then, and then you go to the individual. That's what I was talking about, like jeans, like mending and stains and quilts. And so like, just like kind of how we interact with um, materials and community. So I'll kind of like skip up to, you can just see how thoughtful this is. You guys, like, I love working with Exploratorium so much. Like every time I'm talking to them, there's like eight more people who pop on who are like PhDs who, are, who have been working on stuff. Um, and they're just so thoughtful about everything. But here's 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 the content zone of community. So um, you know, just thinking about materials and you know cracks and curb cuts and pathways. Um, so I think that you know this is kind of the graphic approach. Um, so yeah, this is all probably too nitty gritty, but just. <laughs> And it's also in development, I would know. But anyway, that's that's the care exhibit. So I, I, that in development is just you're just seeing it in development. But I think it's going to stay. I really like the idea because they kind of focused on a particular material for each section, and sidewalks seem to be the right one for community. A good example of a bad sidewalk experience is walking in front of the uh, film streams Dundee Theater and that narrow little sidewalk next to Dodge Street. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's why we moved the entrance to the north side. So, yeah. You got a tough crowd. Whenever we talk about sidewalks, it gets real heated real fast. <laughs> I, yeah, when you were talking about care and uh, you know, community care and then leading to sidewalks. I'm hoping that like eventually the city will understand that it's important to care about our sidewalks enough to classify them as part of the city's responsibility. Anyway, won't go down that rabbit hole. That was thorough. And yeah, awesome. yeah, definitely. Yeah. I just have one more thing um, based on what you just showed, Rachel. Um, I'm curious if they have incorporated any plan like with landscape architects similarly to how they're being so thoughtful with the interior of the building and what they're teaching like is there any plan for the exterior and kind of you know the entrance and the um ingress egress and how people are experiencing that well so yeah i mean hdr kind of you know designed the building and then um and then we you saw that first slide that where we showed like the parameters of um, of the project. So basically the Luminarium project is kind of only, you know, surrounding our building, but yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of thought put into it. You know, there's kind of like this nice little area to the South that you saw when you're looking up and that's right adjacent to the park. And we're trying to think about that experience of going from, you know, there one place to the next, you know, making sure that it flows really easily, that it makes, it makes a lot of sense you know, having that, um, you know, the restaurant there on the exterior. Um, we've been talking about the sidewalk um, to the west to, um, and that's actually still in development, but like it needs to be, I keep saying like, I want like a mom pushing a stroller with a kid on one arm, you know, to feel real, real comfortable, you know, like a lot of space on this sidewalk, but then also making sure that there's divisions from the parking lot, you know, so that it feels safe so that you have like, a, you know, 300 kids walking on that sidewalk and it's not, um, you know, it doesn't feel uh, 
it doesn't feel like you're really you're close to traffic and stuff like that so and then the landscape um you know um uh, with um they're working with ojb on um mecca is working with ojb which is the national landscaping you know um firm like nationally recognized um to develop the parks um, and the parking lot itself is going to be run by Mecca. So we, we haven't yet like kind of developed what the landscape scheme should be for that, but you know, there's definitely going to be like a vesicle station. Um, there's definitely going to be bike racks around there. Um, you know, there's out, there's outdoor bathrooms, which is really nice, um, you know, on that riverfront. Um, but I don't know as much about like the surrounding area because that's it's not part of our project but you, you guys I would really recommend you reach out to Katie because from Mecca maybe she would come talk and she could show you their plans cool um do other folks maybe you folks who haven't asked a question yet have any questions I don't have any questions I just think it's gonna be awesome and can't wait to be like the first person to go through the building. I know that won't happen, but you know, just looking forward to it. Manny, I'll do my best to make that happen for you because <laughs> I don't know. No, but I mean, thank you. And thank you for being here because you're listening to it for like the second time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's going to be exciting and you know, it'll be something fun to do on the riverfront besides just look at council bluffs and you know, I'm excited for a lot of things happening, but this is definitely up there. So. Cool, thank you. Um, John, you oh, so Brian, Brian linked to the PDF plans for the Riverfront, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so there's more detail on, on LCL there. John, you have a question? Just a comment, I guess, or something along the line of a question, perhaps. First, I 100% agree with Manny. This has really been a, a wonderful presentation. So I, I, I just, I'm grateful to be a part of a group like this that gets speakers like you. This is really amazing. So uh, in your presentation, you mentioned something about one of your hopes is that you can get kids of that kind of early teenage demographic coming there by themselves on their own. I think that's, that is just uh, an outstanding desire uh, to help kids become autonomous and do something like that, go on their own. And, you, and then you mentioned something about developing some modes so that they can do that. Can you expand on that? What are you thinking? I mean, more walking, more biking or teaching them yeah. how to use orbit? Yeah, absolutely. Like having the bicycle there, like, like Brian mentioned, having clear signage so central kids know how to get, you know, get there. Um, and, you know, because that's the closest high school, um, not just because it's my alma mater and I love it, but, you know, I mean, I think that, um, and then, you know, there's supposed to be a bus, um, a bus stop um, really um, like right just to the um just to the north of the building so um a match uh so i really want to work with metro to have more frequent stops there and make sure that there's an easy connection from orbit to um the 11 stops are right at the foot of the carry bridge says lori yeah. so like, like maybe signs in the bus or around yeah, the bus. partly in vehicle is for sure yeah happening. Science that says, hey kids, you can get to the science center by yourself. Just use this bus. Uh, yes. any, anything to you know spur that idea that, that kids can go play. They they used to, I did. Uh, my guess is that Clyde did too. Um, we just we just went places on our own. It's a big deal about development, and now that's not so likely to happen. Yeah. I don't think it's entirely because of the mode. I think it's the mode of, of thinking as much as it is the idea of transportation. Ron, well, that's yeah. a great idea. I think, you know, if there's interest, Rachel, maybe Motif could partner and help design a flyer or something or some resources uh, to help educate people around that. That would be a great idea. That's like a really cool thing to, um, to promote. <laughs> I love that. 
It kind of um, reminds me of what we're going to be trying to do with the, the K through 12 fare free with Metro. Um, Mode Shift has got like our little transit team is going to be attempting to partner with some um, central, also in my alma mater, uh, school kids to talk about, you know, just like you're also talking about, John, autonomy and being able to get around without relying on your parents taking everywhere. So maybe we can just keep kind of pushing that. And then by, you know, whenever you said 2023, they'll just be so ready for it. Come on down. Totally. You know, I've been hearing anecdotally about a lot of kids writing Orbit. So, um, you know, so that's awesome. And yeah, yeah, whatever we can do to make that possible. Someone asked about the fee structure and that's, that's a big part of it too, you know, so um, we've been really lucky to have a lot of enthusiasm around this project and, you know, and had a successful capital campaign, but um, we just hired or we're going to, we're just in the process of hiring a CEO. And once they're, as soon as they're on board, one of the first things I want to do with them is develop a significant strategy for accessibility. Because one thing that, um, you know, is kind of an issue with these, um, with any kind of museums is that you need to have like donors want to see earned revenue streams and they want to, you know, and, and they want it to be a sustainable organization and, you know, and you have to have diverse revenue streams in order to, you know, balance everything that you have to do. So yes, you know, there will be a, a paid ticketing structure, um, but I really want to develop an accessibility fund that makes it super, super easy to, um, to get a free ticket if you, if you want to go and can't afford it. Like, um, you know, the explainers at Exploratorium have like kind of a word of mouth campaign that if a high school kid shows up unaccompanied, they get in for free. Um, so like that kind of thing, like, you know, maybe, you know, unaccompanied high school kids get in for free. Maybe we just promote it. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but, you know, um, I, I think it's really important and I want to develop like this, this project is really lucky. It's very strong, you know, in a really strong financial situation right from the beginning. And I think, you know, if we have a fund that's particularly dedicated to free memberships, free tickets, and maybe there's some sort of process where you just kind of walk up, because I know a lot of people who, you know, who have comfortable, you know, incomes, but they can't necessarily afford to come every weekend. And if they're, nine or 10 year old is so thrilled to be there and so inspired by it. Like we want them to be able to come every weekend, you know? So how do you do that? You know? So I think it's going to be, um, and how, you know, cause I think a lot of accessibility funds at museums end up focusing on, you know, the, um, just, um, just like schools, they are 50% or more free reduced lunch or programs that are, you know, dedicated to, um, and, and that's really important. And obviously we want to give as many tickets to, you know, uh, Girls Inc. and Boys and Girls Club and, you know, all the schools that need it as possible. You want to make it as accessible as possible for, um, for every, for everybody, but, you know, anyway, this is, I'm going on and on, <laughs> but this accessibility fund is really important, I think. So uh, exploratory is $20 per ticket. Yeah, Sarah, yeah, it's expensive, right? And so, but this, I'm not sure exactly how much it's gonna cost yet. Like the CEO kind of has to redevelop the business plan. We sort of have one in place that's based on comps and stuff like that, but we have to have revenue. We have to have ticket revenue. We have to have membership revenue um, to keep it sustainable. So um, I think you just wanna give away as many free tickets as possible too. All right, I think my spouse has a burning question as a <laughs> sociologist at Creighton. Yeah, um, it's, I went to a museum like this in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, but uh, often social science kind of gets fallen, falls by the wayside in STEM. So I was wondering if the sections that have to do with uh, society are gonna be linked to social science in the same way as the sort of natural or hard science ones for like the, um, how much weight do you carry? I like, you know, could do some interesting things with the over 10 year gap in life expectancy between zip codes in, in Omaha, or uh, when you start looking at the finance questions, for some of those, there's objective answers, like, uh, can you be poor and happy? I mean, it's uh, statistical rather than determinative, but we know 
we've got pretty good data in the U.S. internationally about how much increasing income at levels of poverty increase happiness, and then it taps out about 105,000. Uh, uh, and other things, uh, does wealth corrupt? We know that that's pretty much true too, that you're more likely to lie, cheat, and steal at higher levels of, of wealth. And one that's of interest to mode shift is uh, been replicated all around the country that luxury vehicle drivers are four times less likely to stop for pedestrians at a crosswalk. Wow. Good question, Ryan. <laughs> I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, no, those, I think I think those are all great points. I mean, I think that uh, so so I guess um, I guess the spirit of the place is kind of this inquiry point of view rather than you know um, uh, um, so like this this kind of discovery and questioning and. So that's kind of like where they're coming from in developing exhibits. I think the kind of information that you're talking about would be great, like in a presentation or in a program or something like that. Like, I'm not sure if they're going to like incorporate those kinds of statistics into an exhibit. It's really like kind of supposed to be experiential and exploratory and stuff like that. So that's just their um, approach. So. I think I answered your question. <laughs> Thanks for entertaining that one. Um, yeah, and I guess I'm interested, I don't know, Rachel, if there are, if Heritage Services, if you are interested, if you all are interested in sort of talking more broadly about ways to potentially, you know, improve transportation in Omaha, I think that's something we're definitely interested in um, sort of beyond this project. I don't know if you have any thoughts or ideas on that. You know, I mean, Heritage funded, you know, that streetcar study like that happened a while back. So there's not, you know, a lack of precedent, you know, in Heritage getting involved in, you know, um, in transportation. Um, uh, you know, I think that um, it, uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's totally possible. I, I think every project that we do, particularly in their public spaces, you know, we just really need to think about, you know, um, the, the built environment and how, um, you know, how we're impacting the neighborhood, how we're building for the future, really, like, and not just in terms of, well, everyone's going to drive anyway, so we have to have park, tons of parking and it's got to be easy parking. I think the other thing that we can do as we approach organizations like this, you know, Heritage created Mecca. And one thing about Mecca is that, you know, it, it is uh, programming the parks is a little different, but before, you know, for, since its inception, its business model has been totally bottom line oriented, right? It's been all, you know, it, it has to, it's, it doesn't have contributed revenue on an annual basis. So it has to make, make money and it's just, but it's supposed to be a nonprofit community organization. So that's, that's where you run into something where they're going to have like all this surface parking, you know, because that's what their patrons want right now or whatever. And so that's how they make the decisions, but that's, if you're a community organization, that's not what's best for the environment of downtown. And I've always said that. And so I think building these organizations that are definitely mission oriented and that are deliberately structured so that they have to be answerable to the community in those ways. Um, and so that they're very interconnected. Um, and, you know, I think a lot about, and, you know, you guys as an advocacy organization, you know, might have you know, some insights on this, you know, so I'd welcome, you know, talking to you about this, but, you know, I think a lot about those cycles of public engagement and like, how do we create these, these, these cycles of input, you know, so that we're not just saying like, we've got an idea and you're welcome, you know, it's like, it's like, how do we make these projects better by, you know, really doing listening and really engaging as many people as we can, so. Um, to make sure they're really serving um, the community, but then also like serving future generations as they're intended to. Cool. 
Cool. Thanks, Rachel. Well, definitely, you know, let us know if you think of ways we could partnership partner or work together um, around transportation in particular. But, you know, I think that we are really interested in, you know, having just sort of better spaces to be a pedestrian or, you know, and I think that this project seems like it's going to help improve, you know, just make it cooler to be a pedestrian walking around that area. Um, you know, so we did a campaign to save the spec building and partnered with a bunch of other groups. And, you know, that some of that is just about having like a better downtown and having it be more interesting and exciting and attract more people and get more people out of their cars <laughs> for longer. Um, do other folks have questions? It's just a really like weird question, I think. Does Heritage Services have a website? Not right now, we will. <laughs> that's that's I'm another excited. change. I know, isn't that like, yeah, we're gonna have a website. I'm excited <laughs> to hear the helm because I feel like, like you said at the beginning, Heritage Services is kind of just like the right. 10 old rich guys in Omaha that sit in behind closed doors and like make all the decisions mm -hmm. and pull all the strings for like everything that happens with a lot of money in Omaha. And so I'm really glad that you're there because, well, because I know you and I know that you're great and I know you'll do good things for it. But I think that like that transparency piece is also something that ModeShift likes to focus on a lot is just like accountability and transparency. And so I'm, I was looking, you know, when we're trying to talk about what you're going to talk about, I'm like, well, I don't think they even have a website. That's right. not anyone, but yeah. Okay. So I did not find it because it, it, okay. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't exist right now. That's, that's definitely, you know, change. Yeah. It will soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Q preliminary. We got the site up with the board and the advisory group, and you know, hopefully, we've got a little bit more transparency there at least. And you know, I'm going around and I'm talking to the groups and all that stuff. You know, change is happening, but um, yeah, we definitely need to get a website up. Thanks for pointing that out, Sarah. It's true. <laughs> I've been saying the same, and no one's no one's fighting me on it. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, Liz, everything you're talking about, I love what you guys advocate for. It's really, really important and I appreciate your work. And, you know, the thing that I kind of talk about all the time is just like human scale, human scale development, you know, like the city, like right now, it's just not built for human beings and like, <laughs> you know, it's built for cars. And so, um, you know, how do we think about that ex experience of like walking up to a building and being in it? Um, so yeah, I appreciate you all having me and if there's nothing else, I'll, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like one thing that I've said to people before, like, it's, it's like you, you you're always a pedestrian at some point, right? Like you, get, you get, have to get out of your car to walk up to the building at some point. So can we be thoughtful about at least that experience? Like, you know, <laughs> so hopefully, yeah, good things will happen. They've yeah. definitely done, done some good things. And, you know, it's, it's a real privilege to be where I'm at, so. John, do you have another question? It looks like you unmuted. No. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just didn't put it back on mute. Ah, okay. My no fault. Worries. All right, any yeah. other burning questions? I guess we'll maybe have a wrap up with a couple announcements if there aren't any other questions. But yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. This was great and it was great to really dig in um, with lots of questions. Thanks everybody for the great questions. Um, Sarah, do you want to take us out with any or circle us back with reminders about upcoming things? Yeah, um, I guess kind of I put the, the link to the College World Series sign up in the chat earlier, but I'll put it back in there just so that um, in case anybody is free this coming Saturday at 1230, you can um, sign up to help us park bikes. Um, it's just the final, final spot, although it has been fluctuating. There's been like spots open and then go down and I don't know anyway but I think that that's that's where we're at on the last one and then um I was going to also put in oh maybe I won't do that uh just tomorrow night we have the um council club situation which is kind of fun um and again we kind of dive through what is happening with the agenda there wasn't um a meeting last week but there will be 
this coming week. So I'll just put this link in in case you want to sign up for that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, just a reminder that next Tuesday is the transit team meeting and everything's on our website, which I will just link. Oh, and then I can't not just tell you to become a member because that's my job. Uh, so you should all become MoShif members. We just processed a bunch this week. So thank you to everyone who is a new member. Drop that link in the chat as well. Um, yeah, I think that's really about it. Thank you, Rachel. This was cool. Thanks for having me. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Take cool. care. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye, Bye, everybody.